357 SIG. We're going to be mounting the Burris Fast Fire 2 on it. Burris has a Fast Fire 3 out now, but it's a good bit more expensive. Um, the big discernible difference that I notice with the 3 over the 2 is that with the 2, it's it's very similar in its size and chassis to some of your some of your other ones that are out there. Um, the the three is a little bit different chassis. It's a proprietary chassis, and it allows you to replace the battery without removing the sight. On this style, you have to remove the sight to get the new battery on, which can change your zero and you know cause you a little bit more work. No big deal. So anyways, what we're going to be doing is, instead of using the adapter, an adapter kit for this that would have you remove the rear sight, and then it puts a little piece in your dovetail and allows you to thread into that piece. So you're attaching your sight back, your uh, red dot sight back here, removing the rear sight, and it, you don't drill any holes or anything in your slide. The other way, the common way of doing it, is to actually machine the slide down probably around here to there, you machine it down and recess the red dot sight down into the slide, which gets your height over bore ratio a little bit, slow, uh, little bit lower. Um, you have less deviation um, of your point of impact to, you know, pertaining to your distance from your target. Um, but you're machining a good bit on the slide. It's expensive to do that. What I'm going to do is going to be, it's, it's not going to be cost prohibitive like machining the entire slide is. I'm actually just going to be tapping and drilling a pair of holes into the top of the slide. We're going to be retaining our sights. Now these sights are not going to be operational because once we get this Fast Fire 2 on there, it's going to sit about like that right there. It sits up higher than your sights do. But we're going to leave the sights there and uh, that way with just an Allen key very quickly one could remove that sight and be able to use your iron sights. Uh, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to look into possibilities of um, using a plug back here and putting one of those, uh, putting the right size key into the buttstock where they can just pull a plug out and they've got the key right there on frame to be able to get that sight off. Now we're not talking about like backup sights, you know, as far as on the fly, oh my sight's gone down. Um, my thoughts on that are, and every time that I've run a red dot sight on a handgun, I was able to train myself to the point to where one of the things that I recommend that my students do if they run a red dot sight, learn to shoot it with the red dot turned off. I mean, you obviously whenever you first get it, you're gonna run it, run it with the sight on. But once you have gotten used to that and you've got your muscle memory up having that red dot sight on where you can come up on target and very quickly get that dot because to begin with, you're gonna hunt for that dot. But once you've got to where you can push out and very quickly you're on, on the dot, then I tell people to start training with the dot off. Get to where you can make combat effective shots and hits with the dot turned off. That is an aiming, you know, that, that's, that's a window there that you can use to aim. Um, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a ghost ring. If you can be, you, you should be able to get yourself to where you're combat effective with no dot, with a dot turned off, looking through that sight. Um, and that's your backup sight if you're running a red dot sight on one of these guns. 
But anyways, that will uh, you know allow it to where very quickly the user can remove this site and use his iron sights if he needs to, um, and he hasn't really lost anything. If he ever goes to sell the gun and wants to remove the site, I'll be able to install a couple of grub screws that will be flush mounted in there. Won't really notice too much and uh, go about the way. So, anyways, that's what we're going to do here. And uh, I think that it's going to be a nice little operation and customers really going to like it. Here, if you wondering about this right here. This is the Apex Tactical Armorer's Block. It'll hold your Glock lower. And this side is for the Smith & Wesson m and It's set up to where you look through all your holes there. It's got cutouts for place for all your pins. Anything that you're working on there. Uh, right here it is set up to hold your firing pin or your striker to where you can service it. It's got some other little features in there. Um, really, really nice, nice piece of kit. So what we're going to do here, first step after I've disassembled the slide, everything is off the slide except for the sights. I'm not going to remove the sights. I'm going to use some dicom here, some layout fluid. Don't need a bunch of it. So what we're going to do here you can get too much of this stuff real quick. It cleans up pretty easy, but and what this is is a contrast basically and what it allows is I'll go in here once it's dried which doesn't take long and I'll be able to take a scribe and like, so right here this is one of the bottom plates for the site and as you notice it perfectly mimics the outline of this site. I'm trying to get where you guys can see the outline of it there. So once this is dried, I'll be able to take this and set it down wherever I want it, and I'll take a scribe, and I'll be able to mark, trace my outline in there without damaging the, the finish there. Um, layout fluid is really good if you're, uh, say you're gonna machine a piece of plate or something. You cover that layout fluid, and then you trace with the scribe. There's all different types of tooling for it. You basically you lay out your design, and uh, once you have laid it out and you've scribed what you want your design to be, you know you, the idea is you do it exactly to one to one scale, where it's perfect scale. Uh, that way, you know you're going to use your indicators on your mill, or your lathe, or whatever but it will give you a visual cue uh, for people that are doing manual milling and stuff. Uh, some people, I mean, you, that may be the height of your accuracy is using the layout that you put on there. Uh, but either way, it's a common machining practice and it works really well, uh, especially for stuff like this. So uh, we'll come back to it once, I think it's probably dry now, but I'll make this uh, another little section and we'll do the layout. Alright, to set up for markings and everything, measuring this plate, this plate's rigid. <clears throat> it actually has a gasket which is flexible, it comes with it, and then a more rigid plate. And to get a measurement on this plate, you want to make sure that you don't have it angled one way or the other. And to do that, the easiest thing to do is get it long ways here. And we are at an inch. Let me get just turned around here. We're at an inch exactly. Now, go and measure our slide 
and we are at an inch and two thousandths. So I'm getting it turned around here so you see what an inch and two thou looks like. Try and hold this where. you can see well right now that's showing an inch and three thousandths but either way I get an inch and two thousandths um, certain what areas that I'll put the calipers on I get basically a one thou I get one inch so basically we're gonna call it an inch and an inch I'm not worried about two thousandths there um, so what I'll do is we'll take our rigid plate here set it where we want it now I'm not going to cheat it back so far. The easy thing to do would be bump it all up right up against this sight. Well this rear sight's got a slope to it. And so by bumping it up there to that rear sight, that's all fine and well if the sight stays the same. But it, you know, considering the possibility of changing out to suppressor sights, which are going to be taller and allow a co-witness through the dot, or through the dot sight, uh, since there is a possibility of that, uh, the sights that, he, that we may go to may be straight up and down there. They may not angle back. So we're going to have to run this forward just a little bit. And one of the things I want to go ahead and point out now before we get too far into this. Some of you guys may already be thinking this. You look right here, you've got four holes there for dowel pin. They're for alignment pins four on the corners there. Those are for alignment pins. The adapter kits and everything, the base plates that are sold for this all have those dowels that come up and they align everything. There's a possibility that only having the two pieces of hardware, the two screws in here, having just those, there is a possibility that we may run into issues down the road with this site being able to cheat a little bit off and losing zero sum. Uh, I've had one do it like that. All the other ones that I've ever done have had no problems in the world. The gentleman that that owned it, he, he did, it was a Trigicon, and he did a lot of, uh, a lot of racking it off the face and stuff. Um, I'm sorry, it, it was not a Trigicon, it was, it was the Burris and he was treating it like a Trigicon. You can still rack this gun off of this sight and by doing it the way we're doing it, it is strong enough to do that. But repeatedly racking it and training or whatever with just the two screws, I have seen it lose a little bit of zero. Still 100% combat effective, but for precise precision shots, I have seen it skew a little bit. And if, if that ends up happening, I'm fully prepared to come in here and put uh, add a couple of dowels in. Probably won't do four, but I'll probably probably do the two rear ones and uh, add alignment pins there and take care of it. We'll do that only if necessary. Um, so, anyways, what we'll do here now that we know we're going to go off of the basis that the sight and the slide are the same width. So I'm going to take a known straight edge. And I'm going to hold this off here. I've got the straight edge flat against the side of the slide. And I'm going to push my plate up against it. Now I'm going to do the same thing over here. And I'm being careful. I'm going to put the bottom of this straight edge on the bottom on the side of the slide first. And then rock it over to where it's flat. That way I don't come in like that accidentally and scoot my plate over. I'm going to do the same thing over here, rock it forward, and I'm going to push it against it. I'm going to do that a couple of times just to make, oh, see I bumped it. I want to do it a couple of times to make sure that I'm not skewing it one way or the other.
need to come forward some to get it off the site. All right, now I'm satisfied with that. I'm gonna eyeball it, and right here at the top, right where the slide gets flat, I'm gonna use those lines as a reference, looking through the dowel pin holes to make sure that it looks like, just by eyeballing it, that we're straight. Now the tricky part here is going to be, I've gotta hold that plate down with my finger without moving it. All right. Before I do that, yeah, we're still good. Now we'll take a sharp scribe and we're going to scribe we're tracing it basically is what we're doing. Now I've got my lines to go off of. Now I'm going to take my calipers and I'm going to measure and measure and measure and measure. I'm going to measure some more and make sure that this is right before I do any drilling or any cutting, any tapping, anything. So I'll be right back after I've measured and measured and measured and I'll explain what I've done. Okay, now. <clears throat> What I've done to vet my measuring, my, my scribing, was basically just measured from the site. And I, I etched in a little center point to each one. Basically etched a couple of boobs there. And now, I'm going to take this center punch here, which actually, the tip of it is broken, but it's the sharpest one I've got, so... I'm going to do my best to make this work. I'm going to sharpen so I can get it right on the point there. And I can get my center the way that it needs to be. This is a very important step. center just a little bit on that, I believe. There we go. One more. What I did was I ended up having a dent that was a little bit off, so I put a dent, cheated the, the next dent just a little bit off to the other side, and that kind of melded the two little dents and indentations together, and then the third one was right in the middle, and I got my spot where I want it. I wish that I had instant access to all the best equipment in the world and the best stuff out there, but I don't. And so I make do with what I've got. And hopefully I'm teaching some of you all or showing some of you all how to make do with what you've got too. don't have to have the best of everything to do things and do them properly. What you do have to have is patience and the mindset to do it and get it done.
My center to center on the holes is good. And that distance is good. Due to the way that the jaws on these calipers are offset, you see how they have opposing slopes on them. If you were to try and measure here like this and spin it around and measure like this, you're going to get two different measurements regardless of if it's right. Because of one side you're measuring from higher up because of this slope. The other side you're measuring right on the bottom because of this slope. So whenever you measure something like this, you need to pick a side and an area and a reference point to measure from and use the exact same one. Now that that's done, we're going to set up our uh, dial indicator and uh, get everything indicated in and uh, drill these holes and tap them. Alright, here I've got the uh, this Glock slide checked up in my drill press. And I'm showing you guys this. Uh, obviously, again, ideally, uh, you'd use an actual mill. With a mill, you can, especially with a numerical display, um, you can indicate off the part itself, um, and you can get things so precise, which, again, for what we're doing, as long as you measure a hundred times, and then take your time doing it. You can do it properly with just rudimentary, rudimentary tools. I can't talk. Got our dial indicator here. And I'll show you what I've done here. Right here on this, this little surface here. This actually contains a bearing within there. This does not spin. This is uh, the guard initially clamped on there. What I've got is a hose clamp and a piece of stamped steel. It bent at an angle, and this is what I'm running my indicator off of. Now, I also have lasers that I can turn on here, but all drill presses don't have that. And so, what I've done, this is a magnetic base. I have this adjusted to where whenever the drill press goes down, my dial indicator will move. Now, I've got my drill press locked. Got the table up. And I've got my drill press locked down to where the whenever it's at stop, it's just a little bit off of there. So the way that I've got this set up, you want to make sure that you have your dial indicator uh, as perpendicular to what it's measuring as you possibly can. Um, it will get a better, more true reading. I've leveled this up. And so the way that I've done this is I don't know if you can see right here, but actually the drill bit is right now it's kind of in between the two uh, uh, divots that I've punched in the slide. Now whenever I run this down it will now the drill bit is touching the top of my slide and my dial indicator is at zero. So I've actually I got a fifty thousandths up is where the stop is. When I come down and touch the top of the surface I am at zero then. That way everything that I count from there is from Anything farther than zero is how deep I'm going into the slide. Now watch this. If I come over here and I move, you see I lost a thou there, but I move over the divot. Whenever I come down here to the divot, look, just that divot alone is seven thousandths deep that I put in just with auto punch. So, you know, and that's another way to tell that you're centered up over the divot is with your dial indicator. Is the drill bit, is the point of that drill bit going a little deeper or is it touching the surface? And so either way I'm going to be drilling over that divot but I'm still going to use the zero, the normal zero there because that's that was the virgin top of the slide. And so that's that's how you know what the deal is and that's that's how we know you know how deep we want to drill or how deep we are drilling and all that good mess. And so um, Anyways, I mean, it's not ideal. It works. It works for what we're doing here, and uh, that's all that matters right now. So, we, uh, we're in good shape.
don't have a brush showing over here right now. I had to get one. It's hard to get an, an accurate measurement while you're actually drilling because the dial indicator hops around a lot. So that's why I'll shut it off and then measure it with it turned off because that gives me an accurate reading. So now it's time to adjust to the other hole. But before I do that, I'm going to blow off the chips and we're going to put our template over it and check it to make sure that it seems like we're uh, going to be hitting the next hole in the right place per where we drilled it, per where we marked it. And here you can see where I've taken the gasket that was in there and we've laid the gasket over it. I know it's going to be real hard for you guys to see from this angle, but the hole versus where we have marked or center punched where we want to drill the next hole they are perfectly in line with each other so we are in good shape now what we gotta do is line up the other hole since this being a drill press and everything there's no way to guarantee that my X and Y axes are, are perfect, are, are, are the way they should be. So there's no choice but to indicate in again. You know, there's no guarantee that I even have the slide 100% level in here. We could be a half a degree off or something. Whereas on an actual mill, you wouldn't have that problem. So.
And what I can do is I watch that dial indicator and where I've punched, I've scribed that hole in, uh, where I punched that little divot in there, I can watch and see where I go from like right here. Um, I'm hitting what, 83? I move in towards where I've punched that hole. Look at that. Now I'm down. So uh, I know that I'm over the hole right there. Now we'll turn that drill bit because you've got two flutes there. And you also can watch that drill bit and see if it wants to kick one way or the other. Now we'll check our other axis and see if we change anything on it. some of our cutting fluid out of the way. turned on there and there right over the hole all right that is looking good Move R zero just a hair. Might have been too much there. I'm going to set it off zero just a hair because I'm down in that divot and I know about how deep that divot was. This side I don't have to worry about as much because um, on the other side, the right hand side of your, uh, of your slide, you've got the, your spring and push rod for your extractor. On this left hand side, it's just solid. So the depth and everything and everything you're doing there, it's not, it's not quite as pressing that you get it right. But I do recommend you go a little deeper on it. Um, that way it gives you that much more strength. Some people would say it's a bad idea because that way you you know don't have to use different screws for different sizes. I say that makes you have to do that. Uh, but either way, I digress. Differing opinions. So, and like we said, 
you guys saw, I'm sure you've already seen in uh, the beginning part of this video, the cobalt drill bits trying to work on this. Now, I have not touched this side at all with the drill bit. The other one, whenever I just started drilling this carbide, um, I had already hit it with the cobalt some. And so, this time, it's just going to be all carbide. Just like that, it starts making chips. Looking good. Sorry, I didn't realize my hand was right in the way. Dead nuts, 320, exactly where I wanted to be. Right there is about where I had it set at under while it was down in the divot. Right there is about where the um, factory finish, the tip would touch the factory finish. And now we're down 320 thousandths. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better cut so we'll blow this off and uh, then we will tap it I actually should have gone ahead and tapped the other side before I change the axis but I'll be able to work around that I'll show you how to do that um, just in case you make the same mistake or you know and, and don't know how to get it back and remember if you see my other videos I'll be using the drill press to tap with 
Um, not by turning it on. You'll see what I mean. Again, I know it'll probably be hard for you all to see. Maybe the angle makes it look like they're off a little, but they are dead nuts on. Very, very happy with the way those turned out. Um, you know, there, there's workarounds if you get them just a little off center. Uh, you know, you typically go with just a little bit smaller piece of hardware than what, uh, say, like the the holes in the red dot will accept. That way, you do ha you can have a little bit of play, but you don't want to get so small that the sight isn't going to be rigid and strong in there. All right, for those of y'all that haven't seen uh, the video showing how to do a tap with the drill bit. So I've got the tap in here, and right now it's just hand tight. What I'll do, turn it on and check for run out. It can be deceiving because that tap, with it having its multiple multiple uh, flutes in there, it can look like it's wobbling, but not. You need to make sure you check your shank up here and see if it's wobbling. And if it's not wobbling when you're hand tight, then go ahead, if I can find my, my chuck, then if, if it's not wobbling when it's hand tight, go ahead and start tightening it with the chuck. I'm going to try and hit it equally on all three of your tightening leverage points there. And it does make a difference when you're tightening a chuck. You can get it much tighter if you will go around it. Even though it's turning the same collar off of the same leverage point, well, I mean the, the, the same piece against each other, it will, you can get it tighter if you hit all three of them than if you just go on one. And also, even on a simple chuck like this, by tightening, you can cause that to get a wobble in it and by only tightening one side. I don't understand how it happens, but it does. Or it can. So what you'll do is turn it back on, make sure that you don't have a wobble. You see right down there, it looks like it might have a wobble, but that's just the flutes coming around. You see up here, it's nice and, and steady. Now, what we do here is, first and foremost, Got to have lube. Everything revolves around lube. <laughs> Those are some words to live by. So, anyways, you want to get your tap lubed well, get your hole <laughs> lubed well, and then what you're going to do is you want to run that down and kiss that tap off onto the hole. I'm going to go ahead, back off just a hair, and set my stop. Well, I said I was going to set my stop. I got to turn the damn collar the right way. All right. Right there. Now what I'll do is, all I'm going to do is set this to zero, right where we have touched off. You don't have to do that, but it will let me know when I'm backing back out, when I'm getting to the end of the threads, so I know when to let off pressure on my hand over here. So. What I'm doing is, I'll, I'll move my hand and hold down to here, to this, this one. I'm just holding a little bit of light pressure right here, and I'm going to turn this by hand to get it started. You want your tap to do the work. the tap this small you gotta watch 
the flute and see if they're bowing. Just then I saw some bow in my tap. Sorry, the wife just, just came out. You gotta watch when you get to the bottom there. Now the other thing to remember is that your bottom on this tap is not gonna be the same bottom you had with the drill bit. So just all things to remember. If you're using a dial indicator, numbers change because your zeros, your baselines change. But what I'm doing is all I'm doing is just keeping positive pressure here and just letting the tap do the work. Right now I'm just turning this up here by reaching in the pulley system because I had it going slow which means it's geared down to where it's very hard to turn that chuck by hand. So if I turn the middle pulley up here it gives me more leverage, but the trade-off there is I have less feeling. So watching the tap is that much more important so you don't break it. Okay, now, if you have done what I did here, and you didn't tap each hole as you drilled them, what you'll do is move over just where you think you're in the ballpark, get you a drill bit. This is actually a cobalt drill bit going back in here. That way I don't run the risk of breaking a, the expensive one-off drill bit there. It's not a one-off drill bit, but it is for all practical purposes here. So we're going to put proper size drill bit back in. Check the run out. And what I'll do here, I'm not going to try and get this thing cinched down. Just want to make sure. And it's straight. And the idea is to go until you get it where it will plunge deep.
All right, we're long Here's something else that's important to show. Uh, there are bottoming taps out there, and if you look at the differences in the tips of these two taps, this they, they're identical taps. I have just ground the tip off of this one, and I've made it a bottoming tap. This tap here is designed to start. You see how the, the threads kind of taper in? That's great, especially if you're doing a through hole. But if you've got a bottom to your hole, the problem is, is that unless you have a true bottoming tap, you can't get your threads all the way to the bottom of that hole because of all this nose, this tip that's sticking out. Because see, the threads aren't full until you get down here, like where my fingernail is. Problem with the bottoming tap is they don't like to start in a, in a virgin hole. <laughs> God, listen to me. Work with me. Stay with me, people. Stay with me. So anyways, that's the difference. And if you need to get a little clearance, extra clearance, what you may have to do is buy two taps. Buy one tap to get your hole started. Switch out to another tap that you've modified or that is a bottoming tap and that'll get you the rest of the way down in there. Before you make the switch, make sure you have enough good thread started that you can effectively get this started without cutting a secondary set of threads. Very important. Very important.